Rumor has it that this game inspired ABBA to write their famous Dancing Queen song. But seriously, playing one brilliant move is a chess dream of many, while this game contains six brilliant moves played in a row, which is an absolute chess mayhem. And the victim, the black player, Carlos Torre, was actually at the time the top 8 best player in the world, and he's the strongest Mexican GM, so not a random Joe. Anyway, let's get right into it. The white player is uh, Edwin Ziegler, and the black player is Carlos Torre. So white starts off with a standard move, black opts for the Philidor defense, which is considered a little bit passive, but still a decent opening to play. D4, white challenges black center. And after this exchange, white recaptures with the queen. Now, generally speaking, it is not recommended to bring the queen out too early because your opponent might decide to take advantage of it. But in this case, it is fine for white to do so because white does not have to waste time and move the queen back. White can instead play bishop b5, pinning the knight down to the king. And so it's still fine for, for white. Black goes bishop d7 to neutralize the pin, which enables the knight to possibly capture the queen. Therefore, white decided to trade it off. And now both sides just develop their pieces. So far, so good. Just a couple moves from now, we'll see something really spectacular. Here, white played knight to d5. In general, it's not recommended to move the same piece twice in an opening. It would be better for white to just develop his dark square bishop somewhere. But anyway, knight d5 is still a decent move to play. And after this trade, black castled, white finally developed his bishop. The position, generally speaking, is about equal, but black is a little bit lacking space. For example, this bishop on e7 is completely restricted, it just can't go anywhere. Perhaps black was bothered by this fact and decided to play c6, trying to get rid of this pawn, which ensures white's space advantage, and maybe deciding to give some breathing space to his pieces. White played c4, deciding to just keep the situation as it is, and after this trade, black played a natural move rook to e8, putting a rook to an open file. White does the same, playing rook e1, putting his rook to an open file. And here black played the move pawn to a5, which at first may seem like a little bit of a strange pawn move on the side, but the reality is it makes a lot of sense because black, generally speaking, would love to bring his last piece into play, this rook, and play rook to c8, putting it to an open file. But black can't do it right now because that move would lose this pawn on a7. And therefore, instead of that, he decided to play a5 first so that this pawn is no longer hanging, and after that he can play rook c8 and reposition his rook to a better square. White played rook to e2, aiming to stack rooks on this open file, and black played his intended move rook to c8. Now, it's hard to believe that this move rook to c8 is actually already a losing error. We'll see in a moment why. The thing is, after rook to e1, white just puts way much pressure along this e-file, and there is no way for black to untangle his pieces after that. But of course, it's absolutely not clear how exactly white should take advantage of that. Black played a natural move queen to d7, connecting his rooks, and it actually looks like black's position is completely fine. But it is losing by force. White starts with bishop to f6, trying to eliminate some pieces which, you know, control the e-file. And after black recaptures, attacking the queen, again, temporarily, looks like black is doing absolutely fine. The queen is attacked, black is going to trade off some rooks along the e-file, and probably will have an absolutely equal and comfortable game. But here is the position where white's queen just got completely out of control. And she moved to g4, offering herself to the black queen. Now, what the heck? What What is going on here? Well, it turns out that black's queen actually is tied down to the defense of this rook on e8 and just can't go away. For instance, if black were to accept this sacrifice, which he didn't, that will lose in two moves after rook takes e8. This rook is undefended and black can trade off on e8, but after that, that is leads to this checkmate, the back rank weakness works in white's favor which means that black has to somehow defend his queen from being captured, while at the same time maintaining the guard of this rook on e8. And it's not that easy for black to do that. For example, you know, if queen moves somewhere just outside, that does not defend the rook and it will be captured and white would win. What else can black do? If the queen goes back to d8, white can actually win in a number of different ways. He can just take on e8 and win material, or even more spectacularly, white can first eliminate this rook on c8, which defends the last rank, and after that, that leads to a similar checkmate on the back rank. But again, black player was actually one of the world's best players, and therefore he calculated all that and decided, all right, no problem, I just need to maintain the guard of this rook, and he played queen b5, which is a correct move for black to play. 
Now from here actually the queen puts some pressure to this rook on e2 and therefore now white needs to be careful. However, white counter that with the move queen to c4, what the heck is going on here? The dancing queen is going completely mad, it's completely shameless and now it's offering herself to the two black pieces, either the queen or the rook. But Black's issue is still the same. Both of these pieces are actually tied down to the defense of this rook on e8. And if either of them moves away, that leads to this back rank checkmate. Therefore, Black can't take this shameless queen. And they still have to find a way to defend their own queen from b5. And therefore, Black is left with a single possible move queen to d7. From here, the queen is safe and it still guards the rook on e8. But white continues this mayhem with a move queen to c7, just offering the queen once again, looks like a give up chess, and I've told you that it's one of the best games ever played, really. Probably you saw this game is in some tactical puzzles, because really very often it's used to illustrate this back rank tactical motif. But nevertheless, black just says, okay, if I can't take it, I'll, I'm just moving back to b5. And it's still very tricky for white to win this game, even though it looks like he's already playing all these beautiful moves, but the situation is still extremely tricky. In the game he played another move, but just to show you how easy it was for white to go wrong, it may seem at first that white only need to chase this queen somehow and trying to deflect it from the guard of this rook on e8. And for instance, why could play queen to b7, saying, hey, if you take it over here, queen takes b7, I'll just execute my rook takes c8, checkmate in threat. So that would be a move that comes to mind. So queen takes b7, or similarly, queen takes a5 is another move that comes to mind. So these two moves look winning for white at first, but actually after queen takes b7, there is a way for black to completely turn the situation around, and he can say, hey, you know what? I'm sick and tired of all these back rank issues, and let me do the same to you. And black would play queen takes c2, this time sacrificing his queen for the sake of the very same back rank checkmate, this sneaky checkmate with rook 2, oops, e c1, delivering this back rank check. And white can cover it temporarily, but after rook takes e1, that will lead to the checkmate, but this time the checkmate to white. Knowing what we now know, we can appreciate the beauty of the following move. White played pawn to a4, and what he does is actually it deflects this queen from the attack of this rook. As we have seen, sometimes if white goes wrong, black can actually use the very same tactical motif against white. And that's the purpose of this move pawn to a4. And after this pawn is captured, white now goes rook to e4, one another beautiful move, and it looks at first like white player is either a complete beginner or is playing the give up chess, but the reality is totally opposite. This is just phenomenal god level chess. Rook to e4. Now, this time everything is attacking everything, but nothing can be captured. Contrary to what we usually have, <laughs> right, in our games. Um, so after rook e4, what's the issue for black? Well, they can't take it with the rook, because now this rook is no longer defended by its counterpart, so queen takes c8 would lead to a checkmate. So the rook on e4 cannot be captured. And the queen can still can be captured because of the same rook takes c8. So Again, complete madness, but black can't take anything, even though everything is hanging. And he has to still move the queen away and maintain the defense of this rook on e8. But now I've played the final shameless move, queen takes b7. And in this position, this move wins indeed. And black got sick and tired and just resigned, because probably that was enough of the beauty for him to handle within a single game. Now, this queen has no squares available along this diagonal to go to, so that it can continue defending this rook. Which means that ultimately black has to either give up their queen on b5, or they have to finally accept the sacrifice, which will lead to this back rank checkmate that white pushed so effectively over the last couple moves. While this game was published in a chess magazine by Carlos Torre, actually we don't know for sure if the game was played or not, because the white player uh, Edwin Adams is actually his coach, so maybe it was some friendly analysis or it was a real game, again, we don't know for sure. But there is one more game involving the same player Carlos Torre and we do know for sure that it was played and it's one more evergreen chess tactical example. In this game Carlos Torre is playing white against Lasker, who was the second world champ. It is white to play. At the moment it looks like white's actually in trouble. This bishop is attacked. But it can't go away because it's pinned down to the queen on h5 and therefore if it moves, white will drop his queen. So it, it may seem as if white did something wrong, but all of a sudden Tora played a beautiful move bishop to f6, just giving up this queen basically for nothing, just for, for a pawn. And black said, okay, I'm gonna take it. 
Queen takes h5, white played rook takes g7 check to the king, and the king went to h8. And right now white only has one pawn for a queen, and it's not easy to create any checkmate because white only has two pieces involved into this attack, and black has a lot of defenders surrounding his position. Therefore, it's unclear how white can possibly checkmate black, but it turns out that white had something completely different in mind, which was later called the windmill tactics. White played rook takes f7, which is discovered, check to the king, and since the rook cuts it off on the 7th rank, the only score available is king goes to g8. But now, instead of moving the rook anywhere or capturing the bishop, white just moves it back to g7, forcing the king back to the corner. And now the rook goes once again, this time, eliminating this bishop from b7, and this is once again this discover check. And using this windmill tactics, white is wiping out black's pieces one after the other, rook goes back to g7, king to h8. I guess it's been extremely annoying for black to play these moves. Here white could have even grabbed one more pawn along the 7th rank, but he decided to just go for the queen this time. Once again, a discover check, and after a king moves, rook takes h5, and now white eliminated half of black's army, and black resigned within a few moves. While apparently Tori was one of the world's best players at the time, there was actually one error in his analysis that he published in a chess magazine while covering the first game that we analyzed. In this position, after bishop takes f6, we know that in the game black recaptured with the bishop, which is certainly the logical move to play. But how about pawn takes f6? Would that save black from that devastating attack? In the magazine, Tori wrote, wrote that g takes f6 would lose to rook takes e7, and that's what kind of refutes that idea. And his plan was after this trade on e7, if everything is exchanged, at the end of the line white goes queen to g4 with a double attack to the king and the rook, therefore the rook will be captured on the next move with a check, and white ends up with an extra knight. Now let me go a couple, go back a couple moves and ask you if the operation is correct or not. Now since it is black to move, let me flip the board. So here's a puzzle of the day for you. It is black to play and if you can find the way out for black, please write it down in the comments below. Now when I show these kind of examples to students, they often ask me how to improve their calculation abilities, how to visualize, and they say that they have issues visualizing more than a few moves ahead, and my response usually is that it is actually unnecessary. You do not need to calculate for many moves ahead or visualize for many moves ahead. There is a much better way of doing it more efficiently. And if you're wondering about this, I've got this free masterclass where I'm sharing with you the right way of thinking, which is actually simpler and also more effective. So if you're curious, check out that free masterclass. Hope you enjoy Enjoy this chess game, let me know what you think about it in the comments below and I'll talk to you soon.